Hello, BookTube. I have a small uh, summer book haul I thought we'd go through. Uh, the mail on a day here in Boston that actually feels like summer. It feels delightful. Uh, it's not much, but who knows what might be of interest. Uh, the first thing is tiny. Uh, feels too small even to be a mass market paperback. So it might be a very short introduction, one of those kinds of things. Or some, something that won't hold much interest. Uh, let's see here. Okay, uh, well, interest of a kind. Uh, this comes out in September, and it is The Origins, The Origin of Others by Toni Morrison, with an introduction by ta Coates. What is it? America's foremost novelist reflects on the themes that preoccupy her work and increasingly dominate national and world politics, race, fear, borders, the mass movement of peoples, the desire for belonging. What is race and why does it matter? What motivates the human tendency to construct others with a capital O? Why does the presence of others make us so afraid? Okay, uh, all right. Uh, this is, I, it's Toni Morrison waxing philosophical. It's prose, but it's not fiction. It's 100 pages long and it's gonna cost $23 in hardcover when it comes out. Uh, I don't know what to make of that. I, that's a, an odd thing to start with. I will certainly read it. It won't be the work of 20 minutes to read, but I don't know what I can expect from it. Uh, anyway, <laughs> a very odd note to start with. Let's, let's move on. Let's move on to uh, this next one. Hope for something just a bit more comprehensible. Oh my, okay, another thing I did not request. This is uh, also due in mid-September by Erwin Chemlinski and Howard Gilman, and it's called Free Speech on Campus. Hardly a week goes by without another controversy over free speech on college campuses. On one side, there are increased demands to censor hateful, disrespectful, and bullying expression, and to ensure an inclusive and non-discriminatory learning environment on the other side are traditional free speech advocates who charge that recent demands for censorship coddle students and threaten free inquiry. In this clear and carefully reasoned book, a university chancellor and a law school dean, both constitutional scholars, argue that campuses must provide supportive learning environments for an increasingly diverse student body, but can never restrict the expression of ideas. This book provides the background necessary to understand the importance of free speech on campus and offers clear prescriptions for what colleges can and can't do when dealing with free speech controversies. Okay. Well, those of you who've been watching this channel for any length of time probably have a rough idea of where I stand on the current uh, hysterical frenzy about free speech on college campuses. I don't know that I'll be reviewing this book because I'm not sure I would shut up about it in 3,000 words. Nobody wants that. Uh, is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, if a college undergraduate is filmed screaming at a college administrator in a quad, screaming at him out of a sense of bawling pre-adolescent entitlement, that college undergraduate should be immediately expelled and also be unhirable anywhere, in any professional capacity, by anyone. Now, I, the first one didn't happen. She, the person I'm thinking of wasn't expelled. And same thing with a college instructor who was caught on camera in inciting students under her authority to physically attack a member of the press. She wasn't summarily fired. She was dismissed months later after a careful inquiry when what she did was caught on camera and therefore required no careful inquiry. <laughs> as far as I know, the first it didn't happen. That undergraduate who screamed at a college administrator on camera to grandstand for a public was not immediately expelled. Uh, I can only hope that the second thing will happen. If you're, if you're the the hiring manager for a Wall Street law firm and you get her application, that video should be the only proof you need that you'd be insane to hire her. <laughs> Simple as that. That She's a grandstanding crybaby who will betray any kind of decorum or respect 
for hits on Facebook. Uh, but I, you know, those things are just the showboating tip of the iceberg. The the safe spaces, the trigger warnings, all that kind of nonsense that that has happened as a result of helicopter parenting. It's happened as a result of an, a new uh, demographic of college students who are so incredibly ultra privileged that they have never in their entire 19 years on earth ever been presented with no from anyone is beginning in preschool when if a preschool moderator tells them when they're you know one foot tall don't do that they tell their parents and the preschool moderator is fired and never works again the parents go after the preschool moderator with a hundred million dollars of lawsuits. And that child reaches age 19 on the campus of Brown or, you know, SUNY, whatever, having never had their will contravened in any way whatsoever. <laughs> uh, so th this, this will, uh, I, I, have, I have heard all the horror stories, students refusing to study Shakespeare because trigger warnings aren't enough because even once they've had trigger warnings for Shakespeare's more gory or horrible plays they simply tell their professor well no I don't want to do that it, 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 the trigger warning isn't enough I find it too offensive to study this material even though I'm at college even though you're the instructor and I'm the student even though you know more than I do <laughs> Oh, well, there you go. You got a nice long 3,000 word rant without paying me. <laughs> okay, I don't know what that was. Uh, yeah, I will probably steer clear of the book. <laughs> anyway, huh. uh, so that's two duds so far. I'd start this off. Let's, let's move on. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, this is also something I did not request. What's going on here? I have tons of requests in the mail, and yet I'm getting all these things that I did not request. This is a novel. Uh, it comes out on July the 4th, uh, called The Reason You're Alive by Matthew Quick. Very colorful thing. Uh, after 68-year-old David Granger crashes his BMW, medical tests reveal a brain tumor that he readily attributes to his wartime Agent Orange exposure. He wakes up from surgery repeating a name no one in his civilian life has ever heard, that of a Native American soldier whom he once ordered to discipline. David decides to return something precious he long ago stole from the man he now calls Clayton Firebear. It may be the only way to find closure in a world increasingly at odds with the one he served to protect. It may also help him to finally recover from his wife's untimely demise. Hmm. As David confronts his past to salvage his present, a poignant portrait emerges, that of an opinionated and good-hearted American patriot fighting like hell to stay true to his red, white, and blue heart, even as the country he loves rapidly changes in ways he doesn't like or understand. Okay. Sounds like a lot going on there. Uh, uh, July the 4th. Okay. <laughs> All right. I am now officially yearning for a Steve book. <laughs> so let's see if we have any chance of, uh, of that happening. This one is from 30 Rock. Uh, oh. oh, very good. Not a Steve book, but it's intended for one of you. <laughs> this is uh, by Walt Williams, and it's called Significant Zero. And the subtitle is Heroes, Villains, and the Fight for Art and Soul in Video Games. There's certain someone out there I want to dragoon into writing about video games, and this will be a perfect salvo. <laughs> uh, from the award-winning video game writer behind Spec Ops The Line comes an exclusive behind-the-scenes look at how today's blockbuster video games are made. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, and this comes out... Uh, in late September, so plenty of time to read it and then write about it. I uh, I just had someone the other day um, tell me that I really ought to look at a video game called Injustice 2 
it's child's play, I guess, in the video game world. But it, this this friend of mine named it for me specifically because it's about comic books, it's about DC superheroes. So I figured that would that might entice me to do to look at it. And I, I said, why on earth would you want me to look at this thing? I have lots and lots of reading and writing to do. And he said, because I want you to see the next generation in computer video game human simulation. Because he'd heard me complain, I've, I've complained many times, the bits and pieces that I've seen of, of, of video games where the humans look weird. They move weird, they sound weird, their eyes, the weird thing going on with their mouth, with their teeth, the way they, it, it, none of it, it all just shrieks of, of computer simulation and bad computer simulation. And he said that something called Injustice 2 uh, will change my mind on a lot of that. I haven't done it yet, uh, but uh, I'm not the one who will be writing about this book anyway. <laughs> so, uh, all right, we're getting down to the end here. We've got two more packages to go to see if we can get a Steve book under our belt. Uh, that would be nice. I don't, I don't quite count as a Steve book a book that I, is a bullseye for someone else. Although maybe I should because part of this job is, you know, as a, is a book review editor where you try to find people who will write about uh, your books. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. It's just a little bit ironic that these two things are right next to each other in the same mail hall. This is by Masha Kessin, and it is The Future is History, How Totalitarianism Reclaimed Russia. <laughs> so I'm thinking... I'm thinking uh, one paid postage will be enough for both recipients. <laughs> Masha guessing. All right, so that brings us to the last book. This is the last one. Oh, God. Okay, well, all right, so no Steve books this time around. But this is the, uh, the rather nice-looking finished copy of River Under the Road by Scott Spencer. A novel. It's a made-up story. Uh, let's see here. I have the advanced copy of this somewhere. Uh, this is due in late June. Uh, and it's, is it a collection of, no, it's a novel, 13 parties over the course of two decades, an opium-infused barbecue, a visit to one of New York's fabled sex clubs, a reception for a doomed presidential candidate, a fundraiser for a blind child who speaks in tongues, a brunch that ends a career, brilliantly reveals the lives of two couples, one hoping to be admitted to the Kingdom of Art, with a capital A, and the other hoping for a small share of the American dream. Okay. So is this a, this is a novel told in parties? That's kind of interesting, isn't it? Huh. Thaddeus Kaufman, the son of booksellers, and Grace Cornell, raised in a basement apartment she longs to escape. <laughs> Well, that's free books. <laughs> I'm going to do my best to ignore it. Oh, who am I kidding? I can't ignore it. Gotta go. <laughs> we were done anyway. I'll see you soon, book two. Thank you.